All righty. Um, I just realised I made a mistake on that first screen. I'm not the immediate president. I'm the immediate past president. So there's a typo there. I had to uh, update it. I gave this presentation about four years ago to the Waterhouse Group over at Innes National Park. Um, they had the famous bee lady, the Dutch lady. I can't remember her name now. Yes, brilliant. And she was giving a presentation on bees. I thought, well, I'll give her on birds and competing between pollinators. So there I am tonight, competing with pollinators again. Uh, you got you got wings, so most birders like anything with wings, whether it be bats or butterflies or whatever. So, all righty. So um, I don't go there, do I? I? Can just look on the screen. Okay, so basically this talk is about Australia's native birds and the role they play as plant pollinators, which particularly a, a lot of our honeyeater species particularly are very good at that. Seed dispersers, which is most of our uh, on our, our passerine species primarily, and then plant pest controllers, which is there again, most of our passerine species. There's, who, who here has a fairly good knowledge of birds, reasonable knowledge of birds? So if I'm saying passerine and non-passerine, you kind of basically know what I'm talking about? Okay. Non-passerines are basically water birds, birds of prey, parrots, and things like that, which um, they don't really have a beautiful song more or less, uh, whereas you look at the passerines, which is mostly our songbirds, which are honey eaters, robins, and all that kind of stuff. So they're perching birds, even though a lot of the non-passerines do perch as well. So there's two kind of categories of, of birds. And so tonight I'll primarily be talking about the passerines. So in the first opening photographs, there's some good examples. A, seed, a good seed disperser is the emu. Uh, they, they eat all sorts of seeds and fruits, and then wherever they run to, they, they do their, their poos everywhere and leave these packages of seeds uh, of native plants, as well as weeds, unfortunately. Um, and the emus are interesting because they have to eat rocks and other things to chew up their food. Um, and uh, so often uh, you get all sorts of interesting things in there. They're not scats. I call them splats because they fall from a great height. And, uh, and often if you pick one up, if it's out in pretty clean mallee, take it home, put it in a pot with some uh, potting soil and you'll be surprised what you get. Mm -hmm. um, then you've got your things like, uh, uh, used to be called a golden whistle, it's now called a western whistler now. Mm -hmm. the, red, uh, the black and yellow bird and then the little mistletoe bird, which I'll talk about in length in a minute because they're quite unique. Uh, and then, of course, honey eaters, which are terrific pollinators. Oh, let's give this a crack to move along. Did it work? Yes. Excellent. All right, so obviously a lot of our honey eater species, we've got about 53. It's not used to sitting down. It's a bit weird. I usually stand. I like walking around and there. Can I? As long as the, will the camera see me though? Okay. <laughs> If you get handed with us, I can see it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll stand up. So I feel, I feel more comfortable standing, actually, because it feels a bit. Yeah. 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 Everybody hear me all right? Yeah. It just feels weird sitting. I'm not used to sitting. I feel like a cracked animal kind of thing. Um, yeah. So we've got about 53 species of honey eaters roughly in Australia. And they all play a really critical role in uh, pollinating. They're called honey eaters, but they don't just eat nectar. They actually most of their diet is insects, actually. Um, but they, I guess people see them on banksies, on on eremophilas and corias, and all sorts of things They're collecting nectar. So they tend to get called honey eaters. But you can see by the shapes of their of their bills, it's perfectly placed. This is with an eremophila. This is my little crappy drawing. Um, so they can their bill, and of course, they get a nice little mixture on top of what's getting the feed and nectar, and of course, they go to the next plant. Away you go. That's the whole process. Similar to what butterflies do, I suppose. The same sort of thing, similar sort of thing. So they're competing with each other, but probably the worst competitor is the honeybee, I suppose. That's been pressure on both native butterflies and our birds as well, so the old honeybee. Um, so that's sort of basically how honey is work. We've got that little 
uh, eastern uh, spine ball, which has got that perfect classic curved bill. And that's probably the closest species we have to a, to a hummingbird in Australia. We don't have hummingbirds, but that's probably the closest species to hummingbirds. Has anybody seen them hovering near a, a flower? They do it for a few seconds, not very long, but kind of, oh, it's almost a hummingbird. Um, but yeah, that's uh, they're fantastic little birds. And of course, then you've got New Holland honey that's doing a classic thing on, on uh, banksies and whatever. And uh, yeah, they're really important. They do a really important job. Okay, let's move along. So that's a, a little bit of a only a small snippet of the honey in the family that we've got. Um, oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I'll try and name most of them. Some of them are interstate. I'm not that familiar with some of them. But uh, we've got uh, the uh, singing honey, which is pretty common around the coastline. And we've got the uh, the honey. If it's blue in the South Australia, it's the rare black chin honey. Either. If it's red, it's the white naped honey. Either. And if you're up in Darwin, the, the red and orange um, eye shade is actually the black chin honey of the species up there, so the eye shade throws you out. So, uh, this is this used to be in South Australia. It's regent honey, it's now extinct in South Australia. It's only found in small parts of New South Wales, Victoria, and it's critically endangered and it's under a, a, a release, manic release program. I actually remember seeing all of those at uh, Blair National Park. The eighth with my grandfather. He was a bit of a bird, and he said, This is a really rare bird. And um, by 73, it was gone. I think pretty well, 1973, 74, B.O. Joseph was the last ornithologist to see in South Australia. It's gone. At the time, it didn't mean a lot to me. I was only a little kid, I was 12 or 13. Um, but as I got older, I realized what I was looking at those few years before. This is a big gap in the Copper Forest, and the Castle Bear Lake Hills, the Christmas honey in it, has a very sharp and sound. Uh, I'm going to pick this up at Christmas, I'm going to do this at Wild, which is uh, pretty, pretty common in the Lake Hills. Uh, Yellow-faced honey eater, New Holland honey, which is the first of the honey eaters to be described by Joseph Banks. It's what's called New Holland honey, but also my grandfather used to call them yellow wings, which is the old name for them. Common names change all the time. It's hard to keep up with common names. Um, Pied honey, and of course, little brown feathered honey. Some of those are my photographs, not a lot of them. Are. Yes. I this one. This one. This one. Okay. Okay. Oh, keep some on your clothes. Makes work hard. You know, you got to earn something, don't you? All right. So as you can see, all their bills shapes are much the same. So they're very much designed for pollinating in all the different shaped flowers that Australia has. If they can't get the bill in there, they just sort of smash their face in there anyway. And they're quite aggressive hunting it is, as you've probably seen, a lot of honey it's are quite aggressive. Even the noisy miner, which everybody hates, mm. is actually a honey. It's a native honey. A lot of people often get them confused with the uh, Indian miner, which is spelled differently, and it's actually related to starlings and it's from Asia. Um, whereas our noisy miner, which is spelled M-I-N-E-R, is part of the Australian native honey eaters. So it is a local. It's just, it's got out of control through the change of our landscape, which I won't go into that because it's going to take ages to talk about that. The landscape's been changed dramatically. We've lost a lot of our own story. Okay. I won't read all that out. That's just a little bit of extra information if you want to read it while I'm talking. Um, of course, the other famous uh, honey, which is a uh, really loves getting into pollen and banksias and all sorts of stuff was the red wattle bird, which a lot of people don't look either. But if this bird was rare, it would be very sort of, you know, a stunning looking bird. Mm -hmm. so I'm going to agree with you on this one. Um, I, I think they're wonderful birds. They're just spectacular birds and they do give the noisy miners a bit of carry back. So, uh, but they're our big, one of our biggest honey eaters. And of course, then we've got the 
in the New Holland honey, which is a mobbing bird, often in a flock of 10, 20, 30, and they do harass and chase other birds away. There again, if this bird was rare, it would be highly sought after. It's a beautiful little bird for looking individually. I even love silver gold. So I can tell they stay so white, mm -hmm. considering what they get up to. Mm -hmm. But as you can see here, this one here is uh, collecting a bit of nectar and then you know, on a little hay here. Mm -hmm. This is a little trivia. Um, with the water birds, as they get older, their wattle, the male, the wattles get longer too. A bit like old rams. Mm -hmm. so, not that rams have wattles, but you know where I'm going. There is other birds that are, are pollinators, of course, and nectar feeders, not just honey eaters. Of course, we've got the famous common birds in the Americas from North America down through Central America down to South America. They are uh, with the most famous uh, nectar feeders and pollen feeders. It's interesting, I'm just going off some Australian natives for a second. It's interesting, there's one particular um, hummingbird, there's about 350 species. Mm -hmm. birds. It's quite remarkable. The smallest ones, I think, it's the bumblebee hummingbird, which is about this big. But there's one which has this really long bill, which is designed for a really long mm -hmm. sort of trumpet type plant. And it gets there. But there's a little hummingbird that's got a short bill that's worked out a way to do it. It comes in from behind, one of the hole at the back, and it gets the necklace. So very adaptive. Of course, then, you know, so you're looking at even little silver eyes, which were very common when I was growing up, and when we had actually. A quarter acre blocks. We had uh, fruit tr fruit trees and veggie gardens. Often silver eyes are very common in the gardens in those days, and they're disappearing, particularly from the Adelaide Plains, very rapidly. Um, but they're they're also insect eaters to some degree, but they tend to also eat a lot of seeds and a lot of um, as well. Of course, they, they've got old uh, rainbow lorikeet, which uh, they're just like kids on sugar. They just go uh, crazy. They keep them cool here, I call them. Um, get a big mob of them, they go in and they just hit the, the eucalypts and the, uh, anything that's barren doesn't be made of. They just guts it all up and go crazy. They just on a sugar high for hours. And uh, they can be quite aggressive to other birds as well. So some of our parrots are um, the good nectar feeders and, and biots and uh, pollinators as well. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the gorgeous little birds. And sadly, a lot of these are, are slowly vanishing. Um, so see this verse. Lots of them. Of course, I'll just talk about the end. That's a typical end, right? My photograph. And if you've only got to identify what's sitting in the middle of that. Pong dong, yeah. So they're really good dispersers for pong dongs. They love the fruit. I like the fruit too, the sweet pongdong, particularly not so much the bitter pongdong. It's pretty hard to handle, but the, the sweet pongdong. Um, the seed, the um, baby swallows up along with a whole pile of other seeds and stuff. And then uh, and that's basically how they get dispersed around. So these birds play a really important role. I remember reading when I was at uni years ago that in Mauritius, where the dodo once was, well, it's Mauritius, isn't it? That's where the dodo was. Um, when the dodo, the dodo had a symbiotic relationship with a particular tree, and so the, the dodo is basically a big pigeon, huge pigeon, and it used to spread all these seeds from this tree around Mauritius. But well, those trees are virtually extinct now because the dodo is extinct. So that symbiotic relationship between that particular species of tree and that bird was really important. And there's a lot of uh, birds and animals that do that. I've worked with mammals a fair bit in the past, and things like little betongs, little burrowing betongs, little um, brush tail betongs, and all those, where well, they used to collect, eat seeds, they were omnivores, but they'd eat seeds and fruits. And they'd store the seeds in their mouth or fruit, fruit, go bury it, and come back and eat it later. But they often forget where they buried it. So hence they were little planters, or it would go through their system and they'd pull it out. Of course, that would be like a little compost package for that seed. Because those little mammals aren't in the environment, a lot of our plants and trees and shrubs and, and native stuff isn't as widely spread as it should be. So Australia is suffering badly because of the lack of these species as we're changing the environment dramatically. So most, a lot of our native plants obviously have a lot of seeds, hard seeds. And so we have one of our biggest 
Actually, this is actually technically our biggest cockatoo in Australia. Now, I know what some people are thinking. You think the barn cockatoo, palm cockatoo. It's got the biggest head, but it's not as lengthwise. It's not as big as the yellow-tailed black cockatoo. That's actually technically from beak to tail the biggest cockatoo in Australia. Mm. We have it here in South Australia, and they come into the suburbs. This one, so they, you know, disperse the seeds of those. But because all of those plants are not readily available, and the land clearing over the last 150, 200 years, uh, pine trees are the alternative food now. So they will eat any any pine cones, and because uh, they only eat half of it, and they, they don't seem to turn it over, the other half they just drop it on the ground. So they're spreading pine trees as well. I used to hate pine trees when I was a younger conservationist, because I wanted everything native. But I've learned over the years to embrace pine trees and love them because they play a critical role mm. in food. Yes, you do need to manage them. You do need to make sure that they don't not spreading. But uh, I do get concerned when I see lots of pine trees getting cut down because people just don't like them. They actually play quite an important role. Mm. Often also to their homes to white-winged chucks and, and a lot of other species using for nesting. And some of our uh, birds of prey using for nesting because they often fairly high tree, probably one of the highest trees in that neighbourhood or that area. So I've learned to embrace the pine tree. Mm -hmm. Plus they absorb carbon and do all that kind of stuff because we really it. So the yellow tail black cockatoo, very powerful bill. Don't, if you ever come across the injured one, be careful picking it up. Use a blanket and some welding gloves because I know of a person who lost their fingertip, uh, a rescuer, a um, distressed bird, just bit through the finger and just sipped it off like secateurs. Very, you know, they're biting through very hard cones and stuff like that. Very powerful um, scissor action, man, so be very careful. So they're good seed dispersers. Uh, rosellas are always eating uh, seeds and berries and fruits and wherever they land on a tree, they poop it out. Um, I remember walking through Belair National Park. I was the senior ranger there for a short period. I remember walking around um, Belair National Park and we always had a problem where you'd have a native tree, then you'd have some olive trees underneath the, the native tree. And for a little while, I think, thank you, then it dawned on me, of course. The birds are eating the fruit and they go somewhere to sit and finish the fruit. When they finish the fruit, they just drop the seed directly down. So often you will see um, the base of big trees. If you can eat a possum, they tend to do that as well, or birds eating the seeds. They fly somewhere, eat the seeds, and drop the seeds directly straight down. Out in the Mallee in Blue Pop Bird Reserve, which I go to regularly, Often you'll see um, small dollars with grain amongst um, some other native plants, uh, some sandalwood or something like that. When I pour on flat carpet, you'll see a uh, corn dong coming out the middle. It's because a bird or something has eaten small corn dong and then eaten the fruit and dropped the seed straight down because corn dongs are a, a root parasite. Mm. So they're going to attach to a host. So, a perfect place to drop the end of the It's wonderful to have all this kicks together and works together. Um, so a lot of our, particularly our parrots, um, and our, a lot of our large birds, uh, busters, uh, the large parrots, um, those sort of species are the major large seed dispersers. And then you get into the rosellas and some of the other smaller species that are seed eaters that will, will disperse some seeds as well. Of course, a lot of seeds, you know, either uh, are prickly and they catch the kangaroos, of course, and other wildlife or humans, and we transfer seeds or the wind will blow. There's lots of different ways seeds can get around, but birds certainly play a pretty major role in that. Mistletoe. When I was growing up, I always thought mistletoe was something to do with Christmas and it's from England, but you soon realise that mistletoe is a native to Australia. Uh, I may be wrong, I think there's about 12 or 14 species. So somebody correct me on that? Anybody mistletoe species? But there's quite a number of species. On mistletoe. And the great thing about mistletoe is that they're a, they're a host, they're a root parasite, they rely on their host. So if the host dies, they die. So it's in their best interest not to kill the host, even though sometimes it can get a bit out of control. We'll have a gum tree that just smothered in mistletoe, and it does tend to take the nutrients away from that tree. That's often because there's not enough trees to disperse the mistletoe seeds. But a healthy mistletoe, this was taken in my place, that Oliver put mattress in LA Hills. This is a really healthy tree with a really beautiful mistletoe. And the thing with mistletoes, which I find interesting, is that they try to imitate the leaves of a host. Not always successfully, but they try to imitate the leaves. 
and fruit is edible by possums and by a number of different bird species. This is the, the mistletoe marl bird, which is the main culprit for spreading the mistletoe seed from tree to tree. And the mistletoe fruit, if you've ever found, found one, they're quite sticky, the little black fruit, very sticky, very viscous. And when the male mistletoe, and females even too, but the male is quite pretty, so that's all right. Most of the males in the passerines are pretty, and the non passerines they all look much the same. Um, the little male mistletoe, which is often not that easy to find, you see they're pretty quiet, only about this big, will eat the seed, you can see, and then um, once it's eaten the seed, or what it wants from it, will spit out probably the remaining bits, but the problem is that they poop it out. The poop is very sticky, it's like very gluey and sticky, the small seed in it. And they turn sideways and they put it on the leaf, on the branch, and then from there, gradually, it will uh, feed into the host and grows this one of the mistletoe. But they're not the only ones who do it, as I found out over the years. The other Mallee bird, anybody want to identify that one for me? Which one? Spiny chin. Another one of my favourite hunt eaters. It's got the... They're just a beautiful, they should really be called pink build, really, because that's the obvious thing. That's the spinal chief there. That's the first thing to see. Um, they're a very, very good insect eater. Often you'll see them sort of hawking in the air, catching insects. But when they're sitting on a branch, they'll just sit there and go. Ooh. And when they fly, they have this wonderful sort of thoughtling sound. They're very beautiful, beautiful uh, honey, the bright blue eyes, the gorgeous. Um, but they also, too, are thought to be one of the big dispersers of mistletoe as well. They eat the seed and put it on the branch as well. If you think about how much mistletoe is around, there should be thousands of mistletoe birds. But there is another culprit, and this is a popular one as well. And that's the type of fruit that is the variation of the fruit. Mistletoes are a fascinating plant, how they have that, that kind of symbiotic relationship they have that. Kind of and look at just gum trees, I'll do it on any tree where it decides to put the seed out. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's not in the neighbors. Mm -hmm. I just mix some stuff off the internet from time to time. It says the story along with that. But anyway, let's say uh, actually what was once called a Port Lincoln 28, which is they're all just called Mallee ringnecks now, Australian ringnecks. They're again common names to keep changing. They used to be varieties of, they vary across Australia a bit in the coloration, but that's basically Mallee ringneck. Mary, it's in a saltbush. And that would be dispersing seeds as well. So seed dispersing is a, is a huge um, popular thing. Um, fig bird, that's up in Queensland. Uh, in, I don't think it's native. Um, and yeah, there again. So they probably do more seed dispersal than pollinating in many ways, but through the seed dispersal, they're sort of basically spreading a lot of the plants, good and bad. Birds don't differentiate between a feral plant or a seed, whatever. Uh, in the current where I worked last, is the ranger and box of them. Every bird is from the boundaries. And, um, you know, you can't control it, you can't. You know, they don't care if it says it's a good self or whatever, they'll use it. And that's, that's the problem. Now, the pest controllers. It's a very important role. And without these little guys, a lot of our native forests are suckling, particularly uh, eucalypt forests. You'll see a uh, eucalypt forest that's not healthy is that all the leaves die and they go brown because all the pests get into them. What you need there is probably the two or three of the most important ones are the pardalotes, there's the spotted pardalote and the striated pardalote, and then there's the thornbills. And they feed on the little lerps and the insects that are in the eucalypts and most of the trees, keep them healthy. If you don't have thornbills and pardalites around you, your native trees, and particularly the eucalypts, will suffer and, and get into all sorts of trouble. And over in places where gum trees or eucalypts have been introduced, like Israel and California and other places, 
Uh, a lot of them are in trouble because they don't have the natural pest control. They have other, their own birds kind of adapt to some degree, but you really need the specialist. So the strata part of the will feed on the lurks at a certain level in the tree, maybe in the middle of the tree, and the, the spotted part of will feed at the top part of the tree. So they both feed on the same thing, but at different levels, and they know where they stand. There's like a pecking of them. Uh, and it's about an inch too. You know whether this is a male or female. Anybody know? A little easy trick to pick this out. The males have white spots on their heads. The, the females have yellow spots on their heads. So if you see a spotted pile that's got little yellow spots on its head, it's a female. White spots, it's a male. It's all the little trivia bits that are, make birding really interesting. I, I guess it's the same with butterflies. There's certain little things that you pick up. Ah, that's a good little bit of trivia. With the uh, straight of pilots, it's, it's hard to know, I think. So they play a really important role. So you've got, in one big say, you collect full of lerps. Um, you, and they're also sugary too, by the way, the casing that has the lerp. So it's, it's sugary, so it's sweet. So it's a bit of a treat for them. You'll have maybe just say the straight of pilots at the top. You'll have the spotted pilots in the middle. And around the bottom, underneath, you'll have a straight of thorn bill or a brown thorn bill, or whatever thorn bill, and they all know their level and they generally won't cross paths. They've got their patch because they're all feeding on the same thing, so they're competing for the same resource, but they know their level. They may swap around, one will go to the top, one will go to the bottom, but rarely will you get them side by side. They kind of know their feeding. The other one, pest controllers, which are really there again and important. And back to the honey eaters. This is a singing honey eater, which I photographed all these in my photograph. This is down at Clayton, and I was sitting there photograph another bird, and I saw this little singing honey eater collecting flying ants next to a bush, and it would sit there and pull the wings off of these flying ants. I thought, oh, it's a bit suggestive. Um, they pull the wings out, and then it take them into the bushes, and what it was feeding its young. You don't feed young nectar, there's nothing in it, it's not enough. Nutrients that are being mixed. So, uh, so it's, it's cleaning up these flying ants. So, feed them. Well, I don't know what the chicks were doing the ants. Yeah, well, it's a lot of protein when they're young. Yeah, because when you say honey, the people keep thinking, oh, it's just nectar. You can't feed young. Hatchlings, you know, nectar, you've got to feed them protein so they grow quickly. Um, so most of the honey eaters, as I said, are insect eaters, so they're, they're pest controllers as well. Um, and also um, our, a lot of our robins uh, are great pest controllers. Um, if you've got robins around your property, keep all your lateral branches about head high. Don't cut them off because you get in your way when you're walking around your garden. Robins are, are pounce predators, so they stand on a branch, you know, look down, drop onto a spider or whatever, whatever may be down there, and they need to come back up to about this height. It's easy in your own yard, you go around, you cut all those branches off because they're in the way when you're walking around. But you need those lateral branches that stick out from your trees at about a metre and a bit because that's how, you generally how high robins sit off the ground. So robins are a great uh, pest controller. Uh, Grey shrike thrushes, one of my favourite birds, they're great uh, pest controllers, even the blackbird. They're great pest controllers, they're a bit of a pest themselves, um, but they do do a really good job. So a lot of our birds are really good at pest control, seed dispersing and pollinating. And one of the, the big issues that's really worrying me as time's going on and I'm seeing things change is the mass use of chemicals on our farms. Um, a lot of these birds who used to go out to the paddocks um, to get insects, they're not out there anymore. Um, you think, well, what's our birds feeding on? You know, okay, they've got native forests they can go into, and some people's yards, but there's huge monocultures of farming across Australia that once had birds, they're not going to win anymore. Stubble quail that were once hugely abundant in, on farms after the, the, the hay was, was uh, harvested and would be the stubble, hence the name stubble quail. Well, they're getting quite rare because they're using a lot of sprays and pesticides and chemicals, which now the birds go in and there's nothing to eat, there's no insects in there. So they're going to organic farms or other places. Um, so this is a huge worldwide problem. 
which is causing the decline in pastoralism across the world. In Australia, we're lucky, we still hear the chorus. If you go to some countries, no, they're there in parts of Europe, it's dead quiet. You know, so it's just mass use of chemicals because of, of uh, efficiency in farming. I'm not having a bad all farmers, there's some really good farmers out there who do really good work and doing the right thing, but so it's, it's getting tough on our, on our pastoralism. So these are also some of the great uh, pest controllers that are the little fairy wren. This is the superb fairy wren, wren which is stunning in full plumage. It just flows like an iridescent lamp. They're great at catching flies and insects. I remember over at Wilson's Promontory hiking around there and uh, the March flies were so bad you couldn't sit outside. And so my wife and I, because we do a lot of hiking, were sitting inside the tent. <laughs> And we had the fly, and, and we saw about four of these just pouncing on March flies on the outside and eating. I said, Come on, you buggers, keep eating them. We want to get outside. And they were just eating them like there was no tomorrow. And, uh, so, so they do a really good job at pest control. The crested shrike tent, which is a lovely bird in that lofty ranges, they eat grubs and things off the trees. They will break the bark open. Uh, you'll hear them breaking bark. That's how you tend to know they're around. And they'll be getting grubs and caterpillars and wood. Uh, um, um, we call it the wood uh, bugs that drill holes. So they do a really good job of pest control. Uh, the tree creepers, this is brown tree creeper. This is brown tree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's a brown tree, 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 tree creeper. They go up the trees looking for insects and grubs and spiders and things to eat. And the satellites go down. So if you see a bird working its way up a tree, it's usually a tree creeper, and one's working their way down for very satellites. You've got the beautiful grey shrike thrush, which is a great imitator of birds. It imitates lots of different birds. Uh, I remember seeing one of these imitating a black eared cuckoo. And I was convinced it was a black eared cuckoo until I saw it in my binoculars. It was a grey shrike thrush doing the perfect impression. Uh, so it's not just live birds, and of course, we've got a, a water bird. Also, I've seen them eat uh, dusty spiders, mm -hmm. uh, black uh, house spiders. It's been pretty gross, you know. You know it's just mine. Yeah. So, the pest controllers, a lot of our birds, particularly pastures, are great pest controllers. Um, I mean, I guess the food is, you know, they're not pests, they're doing their job, but uh, a lot of these pests that uh, the birds eat are also decomposing things and breaking things down, so they have their own job to do. But I'm just coming from the bird's perspective. Then you've got other birds that also do pest control. Um, hawking, that's what uh, all of these honey eaters do. They fly around looking for uh, things to eat. It's unfortunately, sometimes they eat butterflies. Oh, I'm sorry, but they, they, are, they are on the food source. I've got a friend of mine, and Tony knows him, Ian Falkenberg, who's an appropriate name for a raptor specialist. Um, he said there's two types of birds there's raptors and food for raptors. So if I have to accept that, then you've got to accept that butterflies are part of the food chain for birds as well. Um, so you've got the beautiful uh, rainbow beaters, which are still down at the moment. They'd probably be heading back up to the northern parts of Australia now. They don't cost the scrubs, so they'll be down for not for much longer, and they'll head back up north. They come down here to breed and go back up to northern Australia and up in the middle. And they, they are, well, they're called beaters because they catch bees and insects, and they work them you know, crazy on the branch to get the sting out. They'll do that to everything, whether it be a dragonfly, a moth, a butterfly, smack them, just in case it's got a sting. Of course, you've got a magpie. So as soon as you cut your grass, they'll follow behind, eating worms and grubs and all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I don't know worms are particularly a pest, but you know, they can get into it. They have bugs and bees as well. Sorry? And then the kookaburras, which uh, they, they eat everything. I don't just eat fish. They eat, I've seen them eating from mice, rats, other birds, um, snakes, lizards, everything. Well, I haven't seen anything. Any, you know, they kind of get stuck in everything. That's the thornbills, which were the other pest controllers. So there's a heap of thornbills uh, in South Australia. As you go up to the northern part of Australia, they, the thornbills tend to thin out, they become what's called the derigonies, which is sort of just another group of small little uh, insect eaters that are similar to thornbills. 
So they play a really important role in, in uh, feeding the species. Some of them eat seeds, some of them, most of them are insect eaters, but some are uh, omnivorous, they will eat seeds as well. Probably the common ones around Adelaide Hills is striated, yellow one, and uh, probably the chestnut run. Then you get up to the mallee, you've got yellow, inland, brown, and chestnut, probably the and and yellow rump as well. But no, they're tiny little, they're the little little jays that everybody talks about, little brown jobbies that are hard to identify because you really get to get up close to really identify them. Um, but they play a very important role in managing a lot of our eucalypts. Very important role. Now, beautiful robins, isn't that stunning? It's all the robins of Australia. Well, the small robins, I'm not including the northern and southern shrub robins, which are part of the family, a lot bigger, but they're not as pretty. I have that for beauty. You know, the only thing that's come to Australia is that Australians got boring birds. They don't sing well and they're not colourful, so they bring blackbirds, swallows, uh, uh, starlings, and, and, and sparrows here. Look at that. They didn't look too bad, did they? Look at their flowers. You know, their flowers are boring. You look at these beautiful little orchids and things. That's in. So that's our, one of our biggest robins. That's the hooded robin. And the male females are the same. These are all the males. Females do have a better colour, but not much. So the, the beautiful range of robins. The one that's probably common in the Adelaide Hills is the scarf robin, uh, flying down the ferio, red cap out from the Maui in the desert. The yellow is down the southeast, so that's over the west coast. The yellow is down to the salt creek south, and pink is down south, rose is down south, and then the state. So these are the three that we tend to get on. It's sort of around this area up in the back of the hill with the Maui. Well, these are terrific insect eaters. They are the pet, these are the ultimate pest controllers. That's all pretty all they eat is insects and grubs and moths and butterflies and cockroaches and spiders and everything. And uh, the beautiful call. The irony of these is these aren't true robins. They just look like the European robins, but they're actually separate DNA. They're actually not related to the European robins. They just look like it. Because you've got to remember, all our birds were originally called what they were by English and European explorers and settlers. So they were going by what they thought. It's like our magpies aren't true magpies. Another one of the great uh, uh, pest controllers um, is this is the straw neck divers but also the sacred or the Australian white ibis. I refuse to call them bean chickens. I think that's degrading. I know everybody has a good laugh, and it's good that it become popular, but it's also degrading a noble bird. These birds, or the species in Middle East, which are all part of a similar group, they were buried with Cleopatra. That's how they were highly rated, and here we are calling them bean chickens, you know? It's a bit sad, really. So, but this is the real pretty one, because this one, but when it comes into breeding form, it has a straw uh, when it comes out in the chest of green yellow. And it is a beautiful looking bird. Now, often these are hanging out with the white ibis. The white ibis, when it brings its wings up with red underneath, and that's quite a stunning looking bird. They also were known as the farmer's friend because you'll see flocks of hundreds of them in the paddock. After it's been harvested, they will go around and eat the grubs up. And in the York Peninsula, a lot of the little white snail which is introduced, they've got to eat all those up. So it's actually doing a really good job for the farmer. But unfortunately now, there again, with a lot of use of herbicides and pesticides, these birds aren't, can't do their job anymore. And that's why a lot of the white ibis, particularly, which is the more common one, is coming into the cities looking for food because it's not finding it in a lot of the farms they used to. So they're opportunistic birds. They'll be around forever, like magpies and stuff, because they're opportunistic, same with silver gods. They can find alternative food. But that's their job. That's the curved bill is looking for grubs and insects and things like that. The same with some of the shorebirds, you know, like curlies and stuff. They're getting invertebrates and things out of the sand and the mud. And they're not necessarily pests, but, you know, that's how they feed those type of bills. Sorry? Uh, in Australia, we have three species of ibis. We have the Australian white ibis, the sacred ibis. We have the straw-necked ibis. And we have the glossy ibis which is a maroon coloured one, shiny maroon coloured one. It's the smallest of the three. 
But across the world, there's, there's many, many different species of ibis in all sorts of different colors. Yeah, well, that, it looks like a black one from a distance, but it, as you can see, it's got that nice bronzing effect. They're actually a beautiful looking one. Beautiful looking one. And that's how they should be. <clears throat> that was taken down southeast about eight years ago. Look, they're still around. There's a lot of paddocks that just graze cattle and sheep, and you know, there's no chemicals to put on them. So that, they do have places to go, but not as much as they once did. And you know, what a beautiful sight. Beautiful, beautiful sight. There's the venture. <laughs> What a noble looking beast. It's easy, it has been molting a bit, so it's probably looking a bit scrappy. Um, but uh, it was nowhere near a bin. This was over Victoria. I thought about this one. It was at a car park. There was no bin to be found. And we were standing there, and I thought, well, I've got a photograph. You're looking so noble. You let me get so close. Uh, but they're interesting because underneath their wing, it's all red. It's beautiful when they fly. Yeah. As I said, this, you know, the I'm not including shorebirds really in this because that, uh, you know, they do the same job but they do it along the beach or in wetlands. So they're eating mainly invertebrates and frogs and insects and sneezing fish and, and shrimp and all sorts of things. So they're not necessarily pests. That's more the food source that they, they feed on. So you've got ravens, of course, but that's, you know, they eat anything, they eat roadkill kill all sorts of stuff. You know, the herons are great heron, they're great egret, you can not be. Five with the catcher, and I was laying on the beach photo, photographing that. And they didn't move for ages, so poor oh, buggers have only got one leg each, you know. Um, and then I just photographed, and I thought they're not moving. And then next minute, they put their both their legs down and walked off. And so I'm not sure why birds stand on one leg and lock their leg in. I guess it's to rest one leg. And give, I don't know, I've never really worked. Bill, you know that you're a bird. Um, so it's, it's one of those interesting. I just thought it was funny how it was the opposite leg to make them. And then, of course, there's the forest kingfisher. I've photographed that up in Darwin. And there's the black shouldered kite, which is great for managing mice. They eat mostly in paddocks, eat mice and skinks and things like that. But they eat a lot of mice. So they, they manage mice really well. A lot of things eat mice. There's a lot of birds eat mice. We don't need cats in the environment eating mice, what some people say. Um, Rare, second duck, and the pink ducks, and then the beautiful rainbow bees. I think I've probably talked long enough. Look, I think it's just important that we, we manage our environment appropriately. And I, I, I almost sort of cry, into, I, I do cry internally when I see mm -hmm. the suburban spread that we're having in South Australia. It's not just South Australia, it's right across the world, but in Australia, where we're losing our backyards. We basically have a house on a block, that's it. And you see these roofs for miles. Huh? Black roofs, just no trees, no bushes, just a few exotic little grasses. And you think, well, where's the birds going to live in suburbia? And it's just an absolute damn shame. Yep, yep. So our, our birds are disappearing, our variety of birds are disappearing from the suburbs, which is making whatever parts we have with only gum trees uh, a home for all our noisy miners, magpies, lorikeets, our birds that are powerful bully birds, and all the small stuff. Really, when was the last time you saw a really wagtail in the suburbs? Probably not. Very few. You know, they're disappearing very quickly. I'm lucky I live in the hills, and few of you probably do. There's still a good range of birds. Yeah, yeah. Look, there's patches of LA that are still very treed and very green and got good sized blocks, and you're going to have a good range of birds there. But those islands are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So, we just got to protect our environment so our birds have got things to feed and insects to manage because if we don't manage our insects, we're going to be overrun by plagues of insects. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Um, first of all, John, first thank you. That's right, Matt. I think um, 
we talk about the butterflies as being the 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 um flowers of the insect world mm -hmm. and and we're synthesizing the whole philosophy from where butterfly conservation first started to promote the burden of biodiversity because we have the vertebrates without the caterpillars and the and the and the pupae. I call them there, they're, they're the little food parts yes. for the birds. And if we don't have the butterflies, if yep. we don't have the caterpillars, if we don't have the um the the, 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 the pupae, then and all the other insects, then we won't have the birds. So that's really been our message. And I think tonight you've really reinforced that. And I think that all of us need to go go back and give that message out. Mm -hmm. We don't have the insects, we won't have the birds. And the birds and 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 the benefit of the birds is you know, um, dispersing seed, in insects, yeah. yeah, eating the insects, the yeah. pests, etc. Always looking for it like a jigsaw, you know. As the pieces are, you can take a few pieces out, you can still see what it means. But over time, those pieces are disappearing, and you start to get to a point where you can't recognise what the jigsaw is. We're in trouble. That's right. Uh, absolutely. I think everything has its place, and we've got to manage it. Brilliant. So congratulations and thank you. That's all right. Pleasure. It's the message that. We need to pass on, and and uh, the more we understand as well about the birds and the, the combination and the, the interaction is is just so important. Absolutely. So I want to have a butterfly conservation. I'd like to give you a thank you there. Oh, I love it. Thank you, butterflies too, Dan. Have you got it? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I have a couple of copies, Absolutely. and I bought a copy a long time ago. It's a beautiful book. Thank uh, you. But I'll keep this one, and I'll pass my old one to something else. <laughs> That's a different little answer to it. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.